Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Love Coach Scott Katamas, and I am here with one of the most amazing people. I'm so grateful I get to spend time with Eden Amadora this morning. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, and for those of you watching live on Facebook, I want to encourage you to come on into our Zoom room. I'll put the uh, Zoom room link up on the page in a few moments. Um, and it's just great to come on in directly. Easier for us to interact with you. And for those of you that are in our Zoom room with us, our participants, would love to hear any thoughts, questions. And then finally, those of you watching the replay, because that's most of you, welcome. Um, I always go back and I take a look at questions and things that come in after the fact. So um, we want everybody to be included. I am going to put the spotlight on my guest, Eden, um, and tell you a little bit about her. And then we are going to dive into a really wonderful topic sacred sexuality and erotic health. The woman you're looking at is Eden Amadora, and she's an ordained priestess of the 13 Moon Mystery School. Just completed an incredible cycle, which I'm sure she'll tell us about. She's an archetypal voice and embodiment coach, a ceremonial singer, and a prayer performance artist. She has over 20 years of shamanic and yogic training and she focuses on sound and movement integration. Eden's work is in service to those who are ready to embody their most essential radiant selves and to express their authentic voices. Oh, it's so good to have you with us, Eden. It's so good to be here, Scott. Thank you for inviting me. Tell us about the celebration you had yesterday, because I know it's, it's still very alive for you and it's a good introduction to your mystery school. Yeah, it was very, very beautiful. This was the 13th out of 13 day long ceremonies where we celebrated the completion of this very deep devotional container where a small devoted group of women went through a year long training, priestess training and initiation with me. This is deep alchemical work and we're working with different archetypes of the divine feminine. So yesterday was the archetype of the alchemical goddess, which represents changing woman, the rainbow body, the full chakra lineup and the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. It was a day of celebration, a day of what we called the feast of agape, where we were just in complete adoration of each woman in her mythic archetypal essence and gifting her both in reflections and very, very beautiful gifts that were made to honor the woman's soul essence, not an ego fluffing or a, you know, a gift certificate for some store. It was like paintings and poetry and just so beautiful. So many heart tears and joy. And for me, it's, it's the highest high. It's like being on purpose in love as love for love, watching these women transmute so many old patterns, so much conditioning, to rise into this sovereign, empowered essence that they are for their ripple in their, their lives, their families in the world. So I'm just still glowing. I was up very late cleaning up and I still feel supercharged because it was awesome. It definitely shows um, your enthusiasm. As you were describing, you quickly used one of my favorite words, which I think is a good word for us to kind of build on in today's topic, and that was the word agape. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to share with the audience what agape love is? You know, there's many yeah. forms of love as the Greeks, and I'm Greek, so. Oh, beautiful. Um, I always appreciate <laughs> the ancient Greek references. What does agape love mean to you? Yeah, well, quite literally, it's translated as divine love, godly love, sacred love. And this is, this is the kind of love that most humans like you know thousands of years ago they had this ecstatic love for the divine they were much more in that reverent prayerful communion with with god goddess and that agape love could be shared as an offering from their hearts with others to be a conduit of divine love to feel that for the divine and to offer that divine love to others Another couple Greek words for love are philo, that's brotherly love. That is the love we feel for one another that's platonic and deep and soulful. 
And then there's Eros, of course, that sexy, hot, desirous love, the passion, the chemistry, the desire love. And recently I, I heard about these um, three names for love from the Song of Psalms from the ancient Hebrew Bible. And it was very, very similar. There was the word um, raya for this very deep friendship love and the word dod for the passion, the hotness. And then this word ahava for devotional, divine, deep, committed, ecstatic love. And um, yeah, we were in a field of agape and ahava, that devotion for the, the God, the goddess. And when you asked me to come on and do this uh, call and talk about sacred sexuality, I thought about, well, what makes it sacred? And then this morning, just out of curiosity, because I love words so much, I'm like, what's the like Webster dictionary uh, definition of sacred? And it really does mean of the divine or of God and with deep respect and honor, sacrosanct. So sacred sexuality is that bringing some of that ahava, some of that, that agape love into our expression of our, our sexuality. Hmm. That's really, really beautiful. Um, so I, I want us to primarily today focus on the new word that I just learned from you, ahava, also known as the agape love. And um, because there's so much emphasis in our culture on eros, right? And when we think of sexuality, it's very connected to that level, that particular form of love. And that particular form of love is usually quite temporal, you know? <laughs> it, it comes and it's amazing and it's so good and then it changes. And when it changes, people reach out to me for coaching. So. <laughs> <laughs> and me too. They reach out as our lives go through massive transitions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't get many people coming to me during the the uh, honeymoon phase, the Eros phase. It's like right. as that's fading, right? So, um, but I want to acknowledge that um, we really are part of this beautiful tribe. You experienced that with the women that you were with yesterday that did this incredible year-long course with you. And of course, what has naturally kind of evolved is our Saturday Night Alive for the Global Peace Drive. And now it's branching off into other experiences. And so that ecstatic, when you were talking about that ecstatic love, when we're in that state of love for all yeah. and love for self. Yes. Um, and that is to me what, what sacred means. Um, the name of the show is Sacred Sundays. And uh, I'm not religious. I don't consider myself at all religious. I definitely don't follow a particular religious dogma. But I do my best, and I know you absolutely do, uh, to live my life in a sacred way. And for me, that means seeing the divinity in all. Absolutely. A long time ago, I made my a life goal to see God, to see the divine in everything. Um, it's much easier to see it in Eden Amador than to see it in Donald Trump, you know, just to use an example there. Um, and there it is, there comes the challenge. Like, where is it easy to see the divine? And where is it challenging to see the divine? Um, but I just want to say that for me, that is what is sacred. So then bringing it back to erotic health and sacred sexuality, what are some of the ways, the tools, the practices for us to see our own bodies as sacred, even as we age? Um, and every single one of us is aging every day. Um, and to see it in others. Uh, so I'm going to turn back over to you for your thoughts. And yeah, there's so much, so much you said that I just want to mine the gold from. I read this book called We a little ways back, and it was a Jungian book about just this phenomenon that happens when we fall in love, that Eros phase you're talking about that is so hot. And it's like our chemistry kind of sweeps over us and we're just on fire. And most people want to go for that hit almost like the high and all our pop culture, the songs and the you know movies and television shows and the advertising, advertisements are conditioning us to feel like 
that's where happiness lies and that's what everybody needs and if you don't have that disney prince princess romance hot hot thing then something's wrong with you and it's it's really this incredibly sad illusion and conditioning and spell we've been under as a collective because that that sacred union that we're pointing to that scott and i are saying well what happens when we're actually with ourselves and or in a relationship that we've been past that high endorphin whatever oxytocin dump phase the honeymoon phase i think scott referred to it as the new energy phase of a relationship new relationship energy and R E. new N-R-E. relationship energy yeah i think we all know that and you know from our 20s there's that procreation drive too which interestingly is wired into this kind of survival primal you know just that i think some people talk about it as the fight and fuck energy and when we talk about sacred sexuality for me we're really rising out of that root chakra kind of unconscious primal drive into the heart into the sacred heart into this much vaster center of consciousness that begins within how do we create sacred sexuality with another sacred union or experience that sacred energy of our aliveness, our, our pleasure, our Shakti flow when we're alone. And that is to really recognize, like Scott said, that we are sacred, we are divine. So we bring ourselves with wherever we go. And what I thought would be really beautiful today is to share some of the work that I do in what's called the primal goddess temple. There's two temples in the 13 moon year long training. There's the goddess of love temple and the primal goddess temple. And many of the women in my, in this mystery school training are in their forties to sixties. And many of them are single and, or in marriages where there's not a lot of that eros happening. And what they're finding is that their bodies have been shutting down, that there's a certain stagnation, a certain kind of even like like a sinking in or a depression energy that starts to happen when we're just focused on the mundane and the you know the kids the bills the whatever maybe even health challenges in our later 40s to 50s and sometimes 60s so how do we move that erotic energy in a way that not only brings us joy and pleasure and aliveness again but it heals our bodies. So this is a passion of mine and I'm excited to share more about this. In our Goddess of Love temple, we break through a lot of the conditioning around enoughness and this illusion of scarcity. Like, am I too old? Do I have enough energy? Is this even possible to feel myself come alive and my connection to the divine through my senses? we're so conditioned to believe that the divine is something kind of like transcended and outside of our bodies. But in the divine feminine work, we awaken to the divine through our bodies as the living temple, through our senses. So in the goddess of love temple, we we do something called a sensorium, which is to reawaken all of our senses through different textures and smells and tastes and sounds and to allow ourselves to expand our capacity to feel again. So this is a way of coming back to erotic health and aliveness in a very, very deep way with ourselves. And you can do this for yourself. You can do these adoration rituals, self-adoration rituals in your own home by cultivating a safe and sacred space, lighting your candles, bringing in flowers, preparing, in a way it's like becoming our best lovers, becoming that that adoring, present, sacred lover you always wanted first and cultivating that ecstasy for yourself first. So bringing in those <clears throat> chocolate dipped strawberries, those essential oils, and that music that makes you come alive. And then I encourage the women, and I do this for myself, to explore 
self-touch and self-adoration with your favorite oils, your favorite lotion, and to really slow down. So often we do our self-care very mindlessly, not mindfully. We'll just like quickly put on the cream so our skin doesn't feel dry and crack, but it's not a loving ritual. So in your daily life, apart from this more like sacred tantric ritual, to start to slow down and approach your body as a temple, as a beautiful home for your soul, to really see and feel and experience yourself as your best lover, the sacred one. And then in the primal goddess temple, we move into actually cultivating more aliveness and shakti and raising our vibration. And that's the practice that I want to share with you today. So I, I want to check in with you, Scott, just around, you know, if you have any more questions before we go into that practice, because it is kind of a deeper inward dive for a moment. So yeah. well, first of all, it's such a it's really wonderful to have you here. Thank you. And what I wanted to do before we go into that practice um, is because I also teach self-love and give people self-love affirmations. And what I've learned is for a lot of people when they're with me, with their coach, with it, it sounds great. And then when they're home alone trying it, they struggle. Yeah. And, and so I just want to acknowledge that reality. And one way to work with it is to notice as you're doing the I am beautiful and the, you know, the affirmations, if there are gremlins in your brain poking at you. And I intentionally use that term gremlins because they're like little, little nasty creatures and they poke at you. And ideally you just don't pay attention to the gremlins. You notice, okay, there's gremlins poking at me, go away and cast them out. Sometimes we can do that. Sometimes we can cast out the gremlins. And sometimes the gremlins are really ingrained. And if they're ingrained, then that's where it's important to work with a coach like Eden or one of my love coaches to learn where is that voice coming from? Where is that voice coming from? It might have been, it's usually an authority figure that connected with us in, at some critical time in our life. Um, or sometimes it's our own self-doubt, our own self-judgment. Um, but I just wanted to bring that because I don't want people that are trying to do this and then the gremlins are poking at them and think, oh, there's something wrong with me. And then for that to add to a shame story, um, and I can see you nodding your head. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any thoughts on yes. how you work with people? Yeah, I love, love to speak about this too. So one of the practices that I, I give women in the very first temple, which is the great mother, this is before we're invited to get sensual and sexy with ourselves. This is simply just to see ourselves again, like that innocent divine child. And in the great mother temple, there's so much um, that comes up around the way that we weren't held unconditionally. We weren't embraced unconditionally. And so before I was saying becoming our best lover, sometimes first we become our best mother to really rewire that like soothing, like you're precious. And I give women this practice of simply looking in the mirror and softening and emptying with their breath, even if those gremlin voices come up like, this is stupid, I don't like my nose, whatever they're thinking, <laughs> just to continue to breathe with themselves and just to say, I love you, shadow and light. I love myself, shadow and light. And this is not about like killing the gremlins or pushing them away or <laughs> stuffing them in a bag. This is about putting our arm around all of those voices and embracing them. And actually, I, I hear you, thank you, I love you too. You can, shh, it's like a scared part, a very young hurt part. And like Scott said, usually the conditioning, the imprinting, the programming from a parental figure, a teacher, someone who influenced us zero to seven, that what they said in their energy kind of lives on, like their movie direction is still playing out in our heads. And it's time to transmute and alchemize that with love. And only love is the miracle that does this great work. So instead of suppressing, avoiding, or denying, we actually 
listen and feel and alchemize and embrace. So if tears come, mm -hmm. that's sacred. Your tears are, are beautiful. That's an alchemical phenomenon, salutio. Let it, let it flow and dissolve the crystallized, dense, old, stuck energy of I, I don't like my body, I don't like my hair, whatever the little voices are. I sometimes call them pretender voices or not self energy. And just to come back to essence, and what I've noticed with the women I work with is when they're in, in ecstatic states, in gratitude, in joy, in blissful states, it's like years just fall off their faces and their light emanates because we are frequency beings. We are energetic beings. We are so much more than our skin suits. We're inhabiting these, these 3D skin suits with our light. That's why when I think of sacred sexuality, the core of it for me is sharing light and we're sharing light with the divine and we're sharing light with another, if that is in our path, otherwise we are cultivating and sharing light with the divine. So to house more light is to allow some of those dense crystallized thought forms and old beliefs to kind of cook in the alchemy of your presence and just holding yourself as precious and if that means rocking and breathing and crying and just feeling it we feel it to integrate it and it's it's sacred that work is the greatest gift you give yourself and you'll notice when you're running a story of judgment or fear there's a contraction in your body mind spirit there's a like a and the shakti doesn't flow the life force doesn't flow. And as soon as it lifts, as you say, I love you, I love you anyway, I love you with, with the cellulite, with the scars, with the pimples, with the grays, I love, I love every hair strand. We come back into this energy where the, the, the light shines through us, the energy flows through us and we start to open the channels again to receive the beauty all around us to breathe deeper, to feel more ecstasy. It's like we're taking back our birthright, shedding layers of conditioning and veils dropping, illusions dissolving. So it's all part of our sacred sexuality because I like to think of us as creative, alive beings. And we've been conditioned to think that's separate than sex. Like sex is something you do over there in the dark but we're creative and alive over here. No, our sexual energy is our creative life force energy. It's your birthright, it's who we are. We've just been under such dense conditioning from church and ancestral shame programming. So now it's, it's our opportunity to reclaim these bodies as temples of love and light, to house that light of our essence, take more residence with our soul light in these bodies. So yes, first we just hold ourselves as sacred and be with those voices. And like Scott said, if you're stuck, if you're like, you know, I tried the practice and I just cried and I felt scared and I felt lost, then reach out, reach out to Scott, reach out to someone like me. If you're interested in, in invoking and embodying your divine feminine essence, I'm, I'm here as an ally in that journey. <laughs> so much. Yeah. I've made points about six different things to come in comments, and yet I want to really keep it on you. Two fast things. One, um, it you you know you talked about how the impressions that happen up to around seven. I worked with a client actually this was a couple of years ago, but it was so such a good example of this. Uh, it was a couple, and she was an attractive woman, um, and one of his frustrations was whenever he would tell her how beautiful she was, she said, no, I'm not. You're just saying that. I'm, I'm like, like that. it's because you love me. And it was really frustrating to him how she would always push it away, always push it away. And um, because we want to give a gift. It's like if you're giving, when you're seeing the beauty in another and you're acknowledging that, you're giving them a gift and then to have them throw the gift away is really uncomfortable, you know, unpleasant. So. I worked with her on and she said, oh, I've always known was ugly. I said, well, where did that come from? And we did a, uh, a simple hypnotherapy thing and I took her back and all of a sudden she remembers 
this moment on the playground and she's about six or seven years old. She's pretty new at school. Being on the playground with other kids is new. And there's this freckle faced red haired boy looking at her going, you're ugly. Do you know how ugly you are? You really, really ugly. She had no idea what his name was, but she could see that little bugger's face, that gremlin, right? <laughs> saying that to her and 30 years later she had taken on because he was an authority figure he was a couple years older so in her little six or seven year old brain he was an authority figure telling her right and she was carrying up 30 years later and so sometimes it's something that from an objective point of view seemingly silly but at the moment that it happens it's so ingrained and that's where the gremlins can often begin. Yeah, it's like a spell that gets put on us. Yeah. Some negative telepathic agreement that we hold on to for, like you said, 30 years. 30 years. So, yeah, when I, I also, when I work with people, there's a lot of deep listening and where things also are lodged in the body. There's certain parts of the body that will hold these these resonances or dissonances, rather, this kind of static or charge for a long, long time. And it shows up in the way that our bodies hold weight, the way that we hold our posture. There's a lot of releasing that happens in deep, deep, loving, alchemical work where the body will even change. The body will shift and lighten up or open up and detox because we're, we're holding on to so much more than we know. And I I know that we store all this trauma kind of like in the back of this, the brain, the spine and the back body. It's like the past lives with us until we release it, until we allow the energy to move. And sometimes it is through those ecstatic states. It is through Shakti, Kundalini energy that we evolve and awaken and release blocks. So orgasmic energy can be extremely powerful as part of that actual release and opening when used consciously as another aspect of sacred sexuality, whether it's self-pleasuring or in a very conscious partnership where there's an agreement field to hold space for the tears, hold yes. space for the, the shaking, the sound, the, whatever comes up is held in love rather than, oh, that's weird, or that's too much. You know, we're creating a container, hopefully, with self and or with other, where all of it's sacred. Where I know there's something, I, I, I'm just gonna kind of leap and assume that I can pretty much say most anything here. I'm going to, to venture into something called yoni mapping. And for the, you know, the females, the women who are listening, many of us think, have a belief, a deep-seated conditioned belief that something's just not right with us down there. Like, why aren't we super orgasmic or why don't we squirt or why don't we have, you know, this like instant pleasure when someone touches us and we, we store so much energy and emotions in the yoni. This is the sacred portal. It's between the outside and the inside of our very being and it's a portal for life to come through. And that being said, it's so mysterious. Most women think something's wrong with me. I don't look right. It's not, it's weird. There's artists that have done these incredible, just beautiful arrays of different yonis, like hundreds and hundreds of yonis for women to see, oh my goddess, there's nothing wrong with me. Every yoni is exquisite and unique like a flower in the goddess's garden. Everyone is perfect in its unique way. There is nothing wrong with you. If you're listening to this and you found this and you've wondered, is this too big? Is that too dark? Is that right? You are beautiful, beautiful flower. And for us to reclaim our body as that living temple of love and to reclaim our, our yonis as exquisite, unique flowers of mystery and wonder and ecstasy and then to start to explore well what does it feel like even just to be touched with no sexual intention whatsoever and just breathe into the energy there and the emotions block there there's something called yoni mapping you can google you can look up i'm not going to go too deep into it 
but there's parts of our anatomy that hold different emotions and memories, lots of memories. So to, to be with ourselves in this safe and sacred way with deep curiosity, erotic innocence, and a reclamation of what's whole and holy that was never broken, that was never shameful, releasing all those spells, all that conditioning is the greatest gift you can give yourself for your health and your level of joy and pleasure in this lifetime, raising your frequency. I'm so glad that you've kind of gone down this path. And so I'm going to riff on it for a moment. Um, and you know, it's funny, about 80% of our viewers for this show on Saturday Night Live are women, and about 20% are men. And sure enough, as I look at, you know, we've got 20 people here, we've got four men. So guys, this is for you, but it's also for the women. Um, it's so important for us to recognize that a woman's uni is a sacred temple. And absolutely, when you start talking about storing right away, that's where my mind went. Because for the women that I've been close to my wife and, and a few other women that I've had as lovers over the years, I've learned how secret Spock work is like opening up Pandora's box. You never know what's going to come out, but there's so much in there. And it's very counter to what we're taught in the movies. In the movies, we as men are taught that we know what to do. The woman is going to totally surrender. And whatever we do, it's going to feel good to her. And that's so not anywhere near reality. Um, and so it is important for us as men to recognize that any time we're invited to be anywhere near a woman's sacred temple, that it's an honor and to be willing to learn how does she like to be touched. And then if we are touching her gently and right, it's not touching her correctly to get her to come, it's to get her to feel safe find out what does she need to feel safe. And maybe she just needs to be held for an hour. Maybe she needs all sorts of other things to feel safe, to open into her eyes. And then, thank you for bringing up about tears because tears are so precious. And we're taught again in this crazy culture to stifle our tears. So there's something wrong with crying. Again, all the trauma of times when a child starts to cry and the parent goes, don't cry, don't cry especially for men, boys don't cry, right? But the fact is, every time we cry, those tears are telling a story. And if we can, instead of stuffing our tears, allow the tears to come out. And then ask yourself, what do those tears have to say? Because so those tears have a really important story. The last thing I want to say for men, I've counseled too many men, they're like, <clears throat> I can't stand it when she cries after we have sex. And it's like, oh, brother, you're missing the point. You know, that's the time, that's the most precious time of intimacy because something is opened. And it might be uncomfortable to hear because it might be pain from the past or pain about the relationship or things that need to be cleared. But it's just as important Emotional intimacy is more important than sexual intimacy. And as we get older, emotional intimacy is actually the healthy aphrodisiac for sexual intimacy. So I don't know we're going to go down that path, but I wanted to just share some of those thoughts. And thank Yeah, you. absolutely, because we're talking about sacred sexuality, and it's so much more than the physical plane. I mean, there's so much more going on with the emotional body and sharing presence with one another and creating safety. You talked about safety. It's like for, I can speak for myself and for women I work with and know that when we feel honored and we feel like there's no agenda that the man is not trying to get pleasure or take pleasure from us, when there's a sense of being met in service to this shared presence, the shared experience, I feel like it's an invitation to flower and unfold and to ride many, many waves of deep, intimate portals, whether it's just in the eye gazing and touching and the beginning of a connection. If it never even goes towards, never goes, there's no goal. Let's just let, I'm going to just say it like it is for me now, because I know that we're entrained in movies to think that 
like you said, it's about intercourse and orgasms. Like this is this is what sex is. And there's a there's a Taoist book that I love called the Wahu Ching. It's the Lost Teachings of Lao Tzu, and he refers to something called angelic dual cultivation. And I just loved that. I read this this years ago, and I was reading about how it's not about sex organ to sex organ for for people who cultivate the Tao, the holy flow, this life force energy, it's about every organ and every sense and every part of our being communing the yin and the yang of it. It's not just the friction of the sex organs anymore. We're, we're cultivating something much, much deeper that's in the shared presence and the energy between two beings. And when there is trust and honor and a container that's safe and sacred, what opens up is like a portal, a huge like energy portal. Some people talk about sex magic. It's, it's the greatest magic there is. It's this great opening of cosmic energy that's shared between the two beings, the Shiva and the Shakti. So yes, angelic dual cultivation. How do we, how do we house more light together? And, and fly. That's why I think they call it sky dancing too sometimes, this, this level of ecstasy that's so much deeper than a, than a final orgasmic goal. It's cultivating such high frequency, such presence, such a transcendence of time where you're, you're really in heaven on earth. You're in this place where anything's possible in that moment together. So yeah, I'm, I'm all about no goals, no transactions. I've, I've actually heard people speak about sex, like getting serviced or, right. you know, having a very tit for tat attitude. Like I did you now do me. And for me, it's the opposite of sacred sexuality. Sacred sexuality is where there's no giver and receiver. There's a reciprocity and a circuitry that's created where the pleasure to to touch, to look, to smell, to taste, everything is ecstasy. There's no getting, there is only flow, a reciprocity. It's beautiful. Sky dancing was of course initiated by Margot Anand, who's one of my dear friends. Um, in 1986, I went to my very first Tantra workshop. It was taught by Margot and it was her first time teaching in California. Um, and we became very dear friends. I produced her videos and my wife partnered with her. My wife did Watsu at all of her, um, Margot's workshops at Harvard Hot Springs. And Margot was on Saturday Night Live. She made her Zoom debut with me about three months ago. So she's in Bali now. So we love you, Margot. Um, I want to read a couple of the comments that have come in. Uh, Celeste writes, we are supposed to cry. There are about 15 toxins that are only released when we cry. So crying is healing emotionally and physically. Yeah. Nancy Beautiful. writes, laughing at the miraculousness, sacred mysterious joy designed by the great creator is also a great acknowledgement to the I am. Um, and then Nancy asks, which is a good segue perhaps back to you, what process can you provide so that we can return to more joy again. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Celeste. And love to hear from the rest of you. So definitely give us your thoughts, comments, and questions. Yeah. Yes, I want to I want to offer a direct embodied practice instead of talking about it to actually go into a practice today <laughs> with the listeners and for those who are here on the replay. I lead, um, they're, they're more than guided meditations. What I, what I do in the mystery school is a form of white tantra. It's communion with our, our higher self, with our mythic archetypal self, with the goddess, the deity. And it is opening channels that we, we connect to through movement, through mudra, sometimes through sound. It's kriyas and kriya yoga. We use these, these tools. So I'd like to offer that today. And I'm going to start by inviting us to just kind of close our eyes together and find the alignment of your central channel. Often we're very forward leaning. So let the crown of your head come back and start to breathe deeper than you've been breathing. 
Perhaps rest your palms of your hands open and heavenward on your lap. Feel the front of your heart, the heart chakra, lift and move forward. So we're in a way we're giving our mind to our heart and we're activating this, this presence of landing in the here and now in the body as the temple to house more light. So find your awareness tracing down the back of your body and the breath deepening all the way into the diaphragm. Let's take a few deep sighs together in through the nose and out through the mouth. Ah. Letting sound clear the mind, calm the emotions, relax the body. Two more times, deep, deep breath as if you're pulling it up from the great below and then fountaining it over with a sigh. Ah. Last big sigh, using the ah tone, resonating the sound through the cells and molecules, the waters of your being. Deep breath. Ah. Good. Now just letting go of the sound, starting to breathe deeply if you can, just through your nose, connecting your breath and bringing a slight little movement in to your pelvic bowl as if your spine is like a stirring rod or a ladle and your pelvic bowl is this beautiful big cauldron or bowl. And just to feel that spiral, starting to wake up the root, the sacrum, deep breath all the ways if you could light up the bones of your sacrum. And then I'm gonna invite you to rock just a little bit back and forth and notice how as the tail opens up, as we rock on our perineum, the tail softens and opens the root. We are safe and contained in the sacred container to relax and soften the root, to come here now in this body fully, allowing the energy to cultivate there softening the tail. And then as the tail moves back, almost as if you had a primal tail, a big cat tail or a wolf tail, an animal tail that is, that is just kind of flowing beneath you and behind you as the tail lifts back and up. Notice how that undulates the spine and the heart moves forward and up. And there's this connection, this rhythm, this pulse as the spine starts to open between the heart and the second chakra. And then bringing your awareness, that heart that's lifting heavenward, that's opening as you're rocking. It's opening the meridians and the arms, the lines of light and energy going into the hands and feeling your fingertips tingling, your palms opening. Bringing your hands of light slowly together in front of the heart and just rubbing them together and just feeling the connection the soft touch between the two hands, bringing the hands together. They might feel cool. They might feel warm. You're still rocking. And we're just going to bring our hands of light slowly up to our crown. And this is a self-adoration, the blessing of the light and just gently caressing down the two hemispheres of the brain first, opening, lifting the chin, keeping that rocking in the spine. Deep breath, bringing the hands of light to the brow, caressing down your cheeks, holding your face as if you are the beloved, lifting your face to the light, kissing your own eyelids with this intention and attention, adoration, and then bringing those hands of light and stroking down the back of the skull to the base of the skull. And then coming around to your throat, sacred holy body temple this precious part of you your voice your resonance this creative channel feeling the jaw opening softly ah connecting to the throat lifting the chin letting a slight smile this is a taoist practice a little inner chi smile just gracing your face and then i'm going to invite you as you're holding your jaw softly like a beloved just holding your face tenderly to lick your own lips and just feel that. Allow yourself to feel the tip of your tongue 
licking your lips. And maybe if you feel up to just touching the tip of your tongue with one of your fingertips, perhaps the ring finger, the heart line, and just feeling like the innocence of that, the curiosity of that, and then letting one hand of light stay with the throat, the jaw, the lips, and the other one moves down to the heart and the rocking and the holding of your precious body temple. Deep breath, cultivating this sense of love and adoration, holding yourself as the beloved, sweetness, just letting the inner light amplify as if the light sensitive parts of your brain, the pineal, the pituitary, the hippocampus are lighting up, allowing yourself to contain and receive this light. And then stroking down your throat, let's make another sound, a sweet sound, just like a mmm. And feel the vibration in your throat. Mmm. And it's like that yes energy, that yum, mmm, the sweetness letting the nectar of your own saliva come down your throat with that inner smile. Mm. And then letting those two hands come together at the chest, the high heart, and as if you're brushing and opening the energy there, almost like clearing the heaviness. We've gone through so much collectively. Let's just take a few deep breaths of brushing and opening the heart, the high heart and the heart chakra. And then for the women watching, the energy of our breasts, the energy of this sacred, beautiful part of our being that nourishes and nurtures, connected to the heart chakra, and for the men, your chest, this beautiful part of your body, just holding, expanding into that with your hands of light. And then we're going to come right down and just caressing intuitively around your sacrum or excuse me, your solar plexus down to your organs, letting your spine move and rock and undulate and spiral, opening up and all parts sacred, all parts moving into the back body and especially any part that the energy has felt stuck or dense or tender or any part that our thoughts might have been unkind to like, oh, I don't like that role or that extra weight, just holding it and feeling the touch as pleasure, activating the aliveness in that part again, receiving your own touch, breathing. Ah, cultivating light in all cells, all molecules, all organs, all parts, sacred, holiest of holies, sacred body, temple, mind, and bringing our hands of light down now to form what I call a Sri Mudra. That's where the palms of your hands are flat on your hara, your womb space for men, the hara, the dantian, under the navel, the thumbs come together and we form a triangle with our four fingers over the, the pubic bone and just rocking and feeling for the women, the honoring of the womb space, the organs, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, bringing breath, rocking on our perineum, the men sending the energy down into the, the gonads, into the sexual organs, just feeling that cultivation of light. And you can find yourself intuitively spiraling or rocking and feeling this light that's come in through the crown, through the blessings of your own hands of light, your own adoration, all the way to the root and pouring through the hip flexors and hips and glutes, down through the thighs, past the knees. If you want to take your hands of light and just bring them down and feeling the thighs, feeling the knees, brushing down. If you're sitting in a way, you can bring it past the knees, the lower legs and the feet, all parts sacred, every toe tip, a little chakra opening. And for a moment, just feeling the soles opening, the palms are open, and you can bring your hands of light to somewhere to rest. It could be on the body or on the lap, feeling again the crown lit, the back body lit, and the central channel just flowing and the movement by maybe a little more subtle now deep breath and just experiencing the cultivation of shakti flow energy flow chi in native american shamanism it's called orende 
And this beautiful shamanic teacher I had said, the level of your arende, your sexual energy is directly connected to your power as a creative being. So just allowing yourself to expand, breathe and receive the blessings of this light in every part of your body temple. And then let's seal it by bringing your right palm of light to the heart chakra and your left to that dantian, the womb space, the hara below the navel. And I'm just going to give us a little bit of sound here and you can just receive this. My body is a living temple of love. My body is a living temple. Just feeling that as your body is a living temple of love, of light, of peace, of truth, the sacred ahava, this agape love, this divine love starts within. So we cultivate it, we shower ourselves with it, we emanate it. And let's seal this by bringing both palms together in the mudra of namaste in front of the heart. And just bowing our chins and feeling this frequency of joy, gratitude, presence, perhaps even bliss in the body. And wherever you are is perfect. If it's just this feeling of, I am here now with all that is arising and loving every part as it's arising, then you're giving yourself such a gift of alchemy, of sacred presence. And I bow to you in deep honor and deep, deep love. Taking another deep breath and then we'll slowly, slowly come back and open our eyes. Yeah. I bow to you, Scott. Thank you for the beautiful work you're doing here. All the people you're touching. Wow, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. I really felt my tail. Thank <laughs> you for that. I was like, wow, I have a tail. I really got it. That was really great. Yeah. And it, it was also sweet to, you know, the, the direction, the safety, to touch my tongue with my finger. Well, I haven't done that. Yeah, well, in the advanced version, I can give us a little a little insight. Your your mouth and your tongue, especially for women, and I work mostly with women, it's like this holographic as above, so below. And as we activate our pleasure in our lips and in our tongues, we can feel that the the connection between the tip of the tongue and the clitoris, the labia and the lips the larynx and the cervix, the throat and the vaginal canal, the jaw and the pelvic bowl. So all the tension that we hold in our jaw and that it's a reflection of that tension in the, the womb space, the pelvis area. So as we start to cultivate and open up the throat, the voice, the shakti that flows through sound, through ecstasy and pleasure in this area of the body, it's directly connected to the yoni and to the pleasure and ecstasy that we can cultivate in that area of the body as well. Beautiful. Two thoughts, and then I want to read some of the comments. Um, for men, it's since we're talking about how to open up, it's so important for us to open up our throats because, again, uh, there's a direct connection between our throat and our genital pleasure. And especially when we practice Tantra and we learn that it's not about ejaculation, we want to hold the ejaculation, opening our throats and allowing ourselves to just have sound come forward helps us to move the energy and get the energy running. Another thought that came to my mind when we were doing a little tongue thing, I um, had the pleasure of interviewing Goldie Hawn a while back, and um, she's all about returning to innocence. And her earliest memory was being so little that she could get her toes into her mouth, right? And that 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 early memory of innocence and the play of her body, the play of the 
sensuality and the innocence of being that little that her little toes into her little mm-hmm. mouth, right? That that she realized that that was her earliest memory, but it also set the standard for a life of wanting to return to innocence and stay in a state of innocence, which is interesting because a lot of her movie roles, she kind of has that, you know, eternal innocence. And I, I thought of that when I was doing a little tiny finger thing. <laughs> Um, all right, there's some really wonderful uh, comments. Um, Elger writes, what a beautiful goddess. Thank you for this nice healing session from such a beautiful medicine woman. I feel deeply grateful to be with you. Uh, Patricia says, thank you. Nancy says, a glorious gift. Scotty, I do love that we have men with us. That was awesome, for sure. I loved it. What a gift today. Nancy writes, totally divine. Another ma- man, Jane Mayer who created Light Touch, writes, sacred touching, so important. Why didn't they teach us this in school? <laughs> Touch and affirmations, a winning combination. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Deborah Haviland says, beautiful session, thank you. Um, <laughs> Nancy says, I would break my knees and hips if I tried to put my toes in the mouth. The flexible yoga pose. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. Keep those comments coming in and then thoughts or questions you might have. Um, yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Gosh, where to go? Um, so let's talk a little bit about the term erotic health. And obviously that's a lot of what we're dealing with. What are some of the other practices that come to mind that we can do to improve our erotic health? Any, mm. any other practices that you can share? Yeah, well, for, for women, you know, it's really interesting how few women actually get up close and intimate and know and look at their own yonis. So this is something that I recommend to do. And in some of the more advanced circles, I will um, have them look with a mirror at their beautiful flowers. And then in the shamanic tradition, There's a wonderful book called the Kwadoshka, which is about um, the tantric tradition of Native American medicine path. And it compares different kind of patterns in our genitalia to different animal totems and archetypes. So part of our erotic health is not only getting to know ourselves, to accept ourselves, and then to celebrate ourselves exactly as we are and to really learn what we love and what makes us unique. And um, for instance, just you know, in all transparency, when I read that book, I'm like, oh, I'm a wolf, I'm a wolf. Like there was this part of me that was like so overjoyed to learn wolf, wolf women are very vocal. They actually enjoy um, intimacy during their moon time. It's not shameful, it's not, you know, there's some traditions that are like, that's absolutely not allowed. So there's ways as we get to know ourselves, we're not, we're stepping out of the programming and conditioning of whatever, the church, our parents, our, our concepts and ideas through media and pop culture. And we're, we're starting to explore, oh, I love this. I love being touched in this way. So we can actually not only own it, celebrate it, and share and risk being like, you know, this is who I am. It's not weird. Or maybe in my, in my work, I'm like, celebrate your weird as you know, <laughs> magical and different W Y R D be weirder, be wilder, be ready to say, you know, I know that's what you want, but I actually don't enjoy that. I enjoy this, like having erotic health, is being sovereign, it's being empowered, it's being able to communicate about your needs. And this is in you know, a partnership situation where you're playing and learning and co-creating. And then when it's about ourselves, cultivating erotic health for me is so much about moving the energy. And that energy that sometimes, as we've already pointed to and spoken about today, it's it's that those old heavy beliefs, those not self gremlins, as Scott calls it, that we can free ourselves up and discover. Um, there is a practice that I'm going to speak of that I discovered after 
I had a very, very trying experience. I had a dark night of the soul earlier in my life. I had a, a massive Kundalini experience that left me kind of shattered in a way that I had to rebuild and reweave myself. And I was intuitively guided to use my sexual energy to heal myself and come back in to full embodiment. So basically the practice that I cultivated was to cultivate the pleasure starting from the pleasure center, but then to move it through my body with self massage and touch and to actually cultivate this kind of almost orgasmic energy, but without releasing it and then bringing the touch to the different chakras and finding that same current of energy in the chakras where the orgasmic energy, the, the sensation of orgasmic pleasure was starting to build everywhere I touched. So I'm, I'm talking about the throat, the third eye, the crown, the heart, up the central channel, and then to do self-massage, to bring that energy through the body and to cultivate this incredible movement of shakti of pleasure or orgasmic energy where it's not isolated to the clitoris or the g-spot the yoni it is it's we have so much more pleasure than we know than we're taught in all of our body we can be multi-orgasmic on multiple places in the body erogenous zones so this is a practice to play with by yourself if you are currently not with a partner who's game to experiment, you can cultivate this level of erotic aliveness and move energy in your own body through pleasure. Beautiful. Um, I actually, again, studied with Harley Swift here a long time ago when he was Yeah, to so did I. <laughs> and, oh, and yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and kind of that's where I first he had, as you know, the diagrams of the different yonis and the different lingams and then help people understand how different lingams and different yonis could fit together or not necessarily fit together so well um so uh that's very cool. yeah and you know we're we're programmed or we're conditioned some of us unfortunately not so much myself more men that i know have been conditioned by pornography to think that oh a yoni should look like this like a porno pussy and when you study Kudoshka, the swift deer kind of diagrams of all the different yonis, there's only one kind that they usually would have as the porno pussy, which is the deer woman. And the deer woman has very little outer, very little labia showing, and very she's very deep, but she's very kind of contained on the outside. There's not a lot of flowers showing. So that's like a porno pussy, right? It's a Barbie pussy in a way. Excuse my language, but I'm just going there. I'm going to just say it like it is. And so then the porno man is like the bigger, the better. And that's a horse man. So a horse man and a deer woman, there are, they're like our porno people, but that's not reality. That's not real life. And that is actually not like, you know, celebrating the unique and beautiful way that we're designed. So deprogramming from all the porn is essential in sacred sexuality as well. Two, uh, two important things. Yes. And the, the tragedy even is that almost all boys, their first sex, sexual experiences for the first five to 10 years of their life are masturbating to pornographic images. And so it just ingrains this incredibly inaccurate perspective of women and of sexuality and it's nothing short of tragic and it's equally tragic that girls grow up believing that they have to look a certain way to be beautiful or to be sexy and it's this whole really horrific cultural problem um also it's really kind of what i haven't thought of harley in so long <laughs> at the time i'm a wolf man and my girlfriend was a deer woman. And I remember we were trying to, and he was showing the diagrams and we were working all that out. So it's kind of wonderful to go back and remember those memories. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're, we're winding down. And so I want to let people know how they can, because I'm seeing Dia, by the way, writes that your practice today has changed her life forever. Wow. I'm so, so honored. Uh, that may you. <laughs> 
may you do this more than just this one time and really continue to cultivate that. I think it'll come in the replay. So wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And people are laughing about Barbie Pussy and Lucky Ken. Um, <laughs> um, here is how we can get more. I'm gonna show two websites for Eden. Um, her primary website um, that she's had for quite a while is awakening dash beauty.net awakening dash beauty.net and that's where uh you can learn about the mystery school the 13 room mystery school that she just completed are you do you know when the next one's going to start yes i'm going to do a, a shorter program this fall called the sun heart initiation and this is based on that cultivation of the the beloved within and really that divine union within and then in January, I'll be starting another year long training through the 13 moon archetypes, all 13 of the archetypes. And that's going to be both an online mysterium for people who don't live locally, and I'm in Northern California, and an in person circle, God is willing that we're going to be able to enjoy each other's company in person. Continue. Wonderful, wonderful. I want to take people to a second site that is under construction, but it's important. This is um, her name, Eden Amadora, E D E N A M A D O R A, EdenAmadora.com. And this is where you want to put in your name, like I'm doing right now, and your email address um, so that she has uh, your information and she can keep you updated on what she's going to be doing. And what's cool is when you do that, uh, she gives a little gift. What's the gift that people are going to get? Yeah, this is actually a really pretty big gift. It's a goddess mini course to learn about the different archetypes that we work with, the divine feminine archetypes. And in each of these, um, you'll get one a month. It'll have a transmission. It will have practices. Some of them have songs that I've uh, written and produced for each of the goddess archetypes. And some of them even have a, a video link for something to deepen with. So a lot of value in that. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So everybody, that's at EdenAmadora.com. Definitely go and register. So she's connected to you and you get that beautiful gift. Bonnie is asking for the link. Maybe you can write it in the chat for everyone. I'm not sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to put both the links in the chat. Well, I do that. Um, anything else you want for people to know that you've got coming up? I do. I have a really beautiful three day journey coming up called live embodied love. And this is if you enjoyed the guided journey today, this kind of like combination of visualization and expanding our energy and raising our frequency. The three day journey is free. It's called live embodied love. There's a community on Facebook that I, I've started for that live embodied love Facebook group. And I'd love to have you be a part of that three day journey with me. We're going to do three different focuses. So the first day will be raising our frequency, raising our love level. This, the second journey, the second day will be increasing our empowered presence. What is real power and really getting clear about that and some practices to really empower ourselves and our sovereignty. And then the third day is that heart expansion and the magnetism that happens from living with that grateful open heart and cultivating that even more. Wow. So I'd love to have you be a part of that. Live embodied love. The and dates. What, okay, what let they, me, you know, I, I should have looked at looked my calendar before we got on this call. So the live embodied love journey will be in August. So we have a little bit of time. I'm going to see where it's. Coming. Live embodied love. I think I can also. Um, oh, maybe it is. Um, you know what? It could be actually a little sooner than August. <laughs> let <laughs> me get. Let me get the dates to Scott because I'm. I'm kind of like scrolling through my. If you join the community or you sign up for my email. Oh, here we go. I found it. August third fourth and fifth <laughs> august 3rd 4th and 5th live embodied love and when you when you sign up on the eden amadora site i will definitely be mailing you a link to join me for that 
if you desire. So get on my mailing list to come and be a part of that. It'd be wonderful. Beautiful. Eden, I, I just so enjoyed this. Um, and uh, thank you for being so generous with the gifts of your wisdom uh, and, uh, and your embodiment. You, know, you teach embodiment and you are truly embodying your teachings and your practices. It's really quite a blessing to have you with us. Such an honor, Scott. Such a pleasure to share in this way and to connect in this way. And so fun to be here with you and just like improv jam. I love that. I love coming on with you because it's let's always it high energy. It's always let's fun. Definitely, yes. do it again. definitely do it again. Um, and I want to encourage everybody um, next Saturday night's show is an important one. Um, you know, we need to transform our world in many ways. And one is really understanding what we all need to do differently to create more social and racial justice. And just as Eden Amador is who is the most amazing person I know when it comes to feminine embodiment, sacred sexuality, um, I've invited equally remarkable human beings uh, into next week's show. Um, and uh, this summer I'm having co-hosts a celebrity co-hosts every week with me for Saturday Night Live. And my co-host is going to be Antoinette Rooster Tahal and her husband, Pato Bantam, who's an amazing reggae musician. They're going to be playing a concert very close to me. So I've rented a hotel room where they're playing the concert and they're going to come sit with me um, uh, during the show and comment on our amazing speakers. And we've got really some of the great teachers of how to deal with racism. Reverend Bridge Feltis, Ava Park, and Alexandra Loves, um, really focusing on how to understand the history of racism and change it. And then also I'm bringing back two uh, indigenous men that have been on my shows previously that have both had a lot of success in as social activists. Uh, Chief Reuben George, who turned his whole community around, um, and Chief Iron Eyes, who was the attorney who won the battle at Standing Rock. Um, so please join us next Saturday night. And Nina Gray, who is one of our favorite musicians, will be playing music. And, uh, and my teaching partner, Trish Wright, will be with us as well. So that's gonna be a really special Saturday Night Live next week. And Eden, I really hope we can do this again soon. All right? Me too, you can right. do it, yes. <laughs> Thank you everybody for watching and again, you can share this out. That's a wonderful way to um, support us. Uh, since it's our gift to you, gift it out to your community. And again, those watching the replay, thank you. And have a beautiful, sacred day. And remember, we can make anything sacred by seeing the divinity in all. Namaste. Namaste.